And uh, unless otherwise noted by each speaker, the presentation will be made available on our YouTube channel for public viewing. So I think that's it for housekeeping items. I'm gonna drop some of this information in the chat box as usual for your reference. And um, if you have any technical questions, you can send them to me via the chat box as well. And I'll try to help you out. So uh, today I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker who we're really lucky to have us, Dr. John Mola. Dr. Mola is a Mendenhall fellow at the USGS Fort Collins Science Center, uh, where he works on conservation of the federally listed rusty patched bumblebee. Uh, he received his doctorate in ecology from the University of California, Davis in 2019, and his research generally focuses on pollinator and pollination ecology, um, and he uses tools from landscape ecology and conservation genetics. Dr. Mola is also interested in fire ecology, uh, hence his participation in this series, uh, movement ecology and plant insect interactions, and today he'll be talking with us about how bumblebees and the four communities that they rely on uh, respond to wildfire in California. So Dr. Mola, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a real pleasure. Um, we're glad for the opportunity to hear about your work and uh, please go ahead and take it away. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you for having me and uh, inviting me to talk. It's nice to revisit some of this fire work. I'm not currently doing any uh, work with wildfire, prescribed fire, but I really hope in the near future to get back to some of that, especially with some prairie fires out in the Midwest. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna to talk to you about, as the title says, the response of bumblebees and their floral food sources to wildfire in California. Um, the alternative title is some things I learned when my PhD field sites caught fire, uh, which I think is a common story for folks doing dissertations in California. Uh, yeah, and as uh, Chelsea said, I'm currently uh, working mostly with the rusty patch bumblebee, which I'll uh, mention a little bit more um, in a, a few slides, uh, and looking at uh, how bumblebees make use of forests, especially for nesting and overwintering. That's really all I'm going to say about my current work, um, but if, I, I guess that is to say if you have questions about bumblebees generally at the end of this, I would be happy to field whatever. Um, and actually, I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background on just bumblebees sort of in general and some current conservation concerns with bumblebees. So that way we can have a shared understanding for the rest of the uh, more fire related talk. So you may be uh, familiar with phrases like the insect to get in or the insect apocalypse. And I think this is sort of the broad picture that uh, a lot of my work fits into, I think about insect population declines, the causes and consequences of them, and uh, what we can do to uh, stem those declines, basically. Uh, but I think Manu Saunders puts it best in her uh, paper that somehow actually has two colons in the title, uh, stating that there's no simple answers for insect conservation. And the most alarming thing is really how little we still know about it. So that is to say, uh, not only do we not have a complete picture of when and where insect populations are in decline, uh, but oftentimes we, we don't even know some things about the basic biology of insects that I think folks who study birds or mammals or, or large animals might take for granted. Um, just wanted to put that out there as sort of some context setting for where, uh, you know, thinking about insect population declines and insect conservation when you see it in the media. Uh, within that bigger picture, I spend most of my time, though, thinking about bumblebees. Um, and I like to argue that bumblebees are sort of um, harbingers of insect population declines more generally. Uh, and I hope that they're fuzzy and familiar creatures for many of us. There's over 250 species of bumblebee worldwide. You're fortunate enough to have about 24 of them in California. Uh, but the highest bumblebee species diversity is in the mountainous regions of Asia. Uh, as their fuzzy coats sort of imply they're well adapted to mountainous environments. Of course, you may be aware that there are a variety of conservation concerns for bumblebees. Um, you know, they may be communicated in headlines like this one on the left or images such as the one on the right, which is a mass die off of uh, yellow faced bumblebees from Oregon. Uh, and of course, like any number of other organisms on earth, 
Bumblebees are susceptible to stressors like habitat loss, fragmentation, pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, all sorts of agrochemicals, uh, disease, especially introduced pathogens that spill over from uh, honeybee colonies or from other managed species of bumblebee, uh, and of course, climate change. And then, uh, you know, sadly, the interactive or additive effects of all of these stressors. Uh, and like I said, right now, a lot of my research and a lot of the energy, I think, for bumblebee conservation generally within North America is centered around the rusty patch bumblebee, named for its adorable rusty patch on its abdomen. Uh, this species is the first and only federally listed bumblebee species in the United States. Um, and it's actually the uh, first and only federally listed bee species within the continental United States. So right now, uh, I think it's a very interesting area to be doing research um, because sort of the decisions we make about what we prioritize or how we inform management with our science uh, I think really is going to set the model for uh, how we do science and uh, restoration or management efforts with other bee species that are almost inevitably going to be listed in the near future. Um, so you don't have uh, rusty patch bumblebees uh, currently or ever uh, where you most likely are listening to this from. Uh, but I, I did want to highlight a few other species that might be on your radar, um, including Bombus crotchii, Franklin eye, Occidentalis, which is also known as the Western bumblebee. And uh, assuming you're all listening to this from California, Bombus occidentalis, uh, if Zoom and PowerPoint had existed 30 years ago and I was giving you this talk, that would be your most common bumblebee uh, in your region, but now is very rare. Uh, and then Bombus sucleae. Uh, these four species were proposed for listing under the California Endangered Species Act. Um, I consider myself more of a scientist, so I don't quite understand what happened in that process, but basically it's not uh, proceeding through uh, normal means, but it's now in some sort of legal battle. Um, so if, these species become listed under the California Endangered Species Act. They would be the first uh, insects listed under the CESA. Um, and that would obviously have big implications for land management within the region. Uh, and Suclei and Occidentalis are both petitioned for listing under the Federal Endangered Species Act. So these are, um, so just to say basically that bumblebee conservation, if it's not currently uh, in your thought process, it may very well be in your thought process in the near future. Uh, and if you're interested in, in learning some more about bumblebee conservation generally, uh, you can Google or attempt to rapidly scan um, to find an assessment that I helped contribute to uh, the IUCN Bumblebee Specialist Group's update for 2020. Uh, and that'll include all sorts of useful information on uh, current status of many bumblebees. Um, but I also wanted to point out, you know, this isn't maybe the most relevant thing for folks in California or me here in Colorado, but, you know, I mentioned bumblebee species diversity is highest within uh, the Asia, basically mountainous regions in Asia, but we lack IUCN assessments for any of those species. Uh, and even for several North American species, we basically don't know much about their natural history or current population status. All right, and there's a whole bunch of reasons, if you're not convinced about the intrinsic value of bumblebees, there's a whole bunch of reasons to be interested in them, uh, perhaps because of crop pollination, where they're important pollinators of peppers, tomatoes, uh, blueberries, basically things that require buzz pollination, where honeybees are pretty ineffective pollinators. Uh, I think more important to me and to our souls, is uh, bumblebees importance as uh, pollinators, especially of spring wildflowers. Uh, and then lastly, if you're into things like behavioral ecology or uh, cross species sports, you can also train bumblebees to play football. And uh, you know that, that I guess can yield things about animal cognition uh, if you fancy that sort of thing. So uh, to get everybody on the same page about some aspects of the bumblebee life cycle, 
Um, it's a, a little bit different than the, well, actually it's a lot different than the honeybee life cycle um, in the sense that honeybees sort of have these perennial colonies. Bumblebees are annual social organisms. So that is that means that they start out as solitary uh, individuals, go through a social phase and then are back to solitary. So to walk you through that a little bit, uh, queen bumblebees emerge in the springtime. Uh, and I can't tell if you can see my pointer or not, but uh, okay. Yeah, so queen bumblebees emerge in the springtime, uh, carrying with them all the sperm and eggs that they'll need to establish colonies. They don't have a worker cast with them, just sperm and eggs uh, within them. Uh, and they'll forage basically to establish their colony, typically underground, um, though some species nest on the surface or uh, in tree cavities. Uh, once they establish that colony um, and basically produce their first uh, sets of workers, the queen will then remain underground and those workers will be the bumblebees that you see foraging out on the landscape. That colony grows through successive cohorts until hopefully it's reproductively mature uh, late in the summer or early in the fall uh, where new queens and males are produced. Those queens and males mate everyone except the new queens dies uh, and the new queens overwinter to restart our cycle. So there's really two things that I, I want you to take from this. One is that uh, we go through, we have these very demographically important queens who emerge as solitary individuals first. And the second thing I want you to recall is that bumblebees have a very long foraging season. So these queens emerge early in the spring and the colony grows to a larger and larger size late into summer or early fall, uh, requiring a lot of resources throughout the season. And the reason that's important to keep in mind or think of if you're concerned about conservation more broadly is you might imagine something like uh, a flowering plant community represented here by curves of different colors representing different species. The bumblebee flight season and bumblebee resource needs are going to overlap with almost all of those plants within a given community. Uh, whereas smaller or solitary bees or other pollinators like butterflies might interact with just one or two of these plants throughout their entire flight season. So if we can address conservation issues and, and uh, plant restoration needs for bumblebee habitat, that's typically going to uh, cover a lot of other pollinators acting as sort of an umbrella species, if you like that term. Okay, so that is your uh, background on bumblebee biology and current bumblebee conservation issues. Uh, but now we're going to get into uh, some previous research of mine looking at bumblebees and wildfire, as is the objective of this seminar series. So this work uh, that I'm going to talk to you about is focused around two wildfires uh, in the uh, coast range around uh, ooh, Clear Lake, California. It's amazing how fast I can forget names in just three years. Um, so we'll be talking about the Rocky and Jerusalem fire, but I think you know it should come as no surprise to listeners here that wildfire can massively alter landscapes, uh, can have huge effects on plant and animal communities, as well as soils, hydrology, uh, and it is a very important disturbance force in arid regions throughout the world. Uh, and sometimes after fire, of course, we have these landscapes that look like this, temporarily barren grasslands surrounded by charred chaparral. Uh, but we can also have these rushes of flowers following these fires. Uh, and there's been a lot that's been learned and documented about changes in post-fire plant diversity, floral abundance, morphology. Uh, and, and when I see these flowers, I think they're dazzling and beautiful, uh, but I also think they're fantastic opportunities to look at how the obligate visitors of those flowers respond to fire. Um, and so that is to say, how do bumblebees or bees generally uh, respond to post-fire environments? There are, of course, a few things that we might expect that change in burned landscapes that uh, maybe beneficial, positive or negative to bees. Uh, first is that we often do have these scenarios with abundant and diverse flowers following fire. There are also changes in the availability of nesting habitat. Um, so 
you might imagine for ground nesting bees, uh, of which most species are, uh, that you know, fire opens up a lot of bare ground that may open a lot up a lot of nesting opportunity. But for twig nesting species, fire may be a mass mortality event. Additionally, there are changes in nectar concentration and sort of the quality of floral resources following fire. Uh, so this graph is recreated from a study that looked at um, nectar concentration across a range of uh, time since fire in the Mediterranean and found that basically nectar concentration was highest in most recently burned sites. Uh, and there's also uh, several space for time substitutions that look at uh, the effects of fire on bees and basically find that bee diversity and abundance is often highest in the most recently burned uh, sites. And uh, I think this paper is definitely worth having on your radar if uh, pollinators and fire is a topic of interest. Uh, this is by Lauren Panizio and others. Uh, power diversity begets plant pollinator community diversity. Uh, and basically they looked at uh, what they considered uh, sites varying in their pyrodiversity. So the heterogeneity of, of fire, if you will, and found that basically at sites with um, more variable fire history, you had uh, more diverse pollinator communities. And I think that makes sense. You have higher habitat heterogeneity, you have higher species diversity. Uh, and so that's all to say that basically when uh, folks conduct meta-analyses, what they find is that there's generally positive effects of fire on bee abundance. Uh, in this meta-analysis, they've lumped all hymenoptera together. So bees, wasps, ants. Um, and found that basically uh, when you compare burned and unburned areas, uh, fire has positive effects on abundance and diversity. Uh, but sort of like I alluded to, most of this comes from space for time substitutions or community level studies um, and leaves, I think, a, a lot to be desired still, uh, where we may want to know, are there actual changes in the population sizes of pollinators of interest? So uh, when we put out bee bowls or passive sampling, uh, uh, tools basically in burned or unburned areas, uh, we might not actually be seeing an increase in the bee population. What we might be seeing is that the existing population is now concentrated into some smaller areas. Uh, so in order to look at that, we really need data from before and after fire. Um, if we're interested in particular species, we might also be interested interested in intraspecific variability. So do things like body sizes or fat body content change uh, as the landscape changes due to fire, as those things can be associated with um, survival or reproduction. Uh, and we might also be interested in demographic effects. So how does fire affect uh, sex ratios or um, the abundance of reproductive individuals rather than uh, workers or something like that? So when I began my PhD, I actually wasn't thinking about any of that. Instead, uh, what I was interested in studying with bumblebees was questions like foraging range, dispersal distance, colony abundance, these things that, once again, I think uh, folks studying larger organisms might take for granted because you can sort of collar animals or tag them or use like crazy GPS things. Uh, but we're still stuck in the ages of like gluing little numbered tags to bees and hoping we reobserve a couple of them. Uh, so to get at these questions though, I went out to the McLaughlin Reserve, um, which maybe some of y'all have been out there. It's a pretty gorgeous place. Uh, and I began collecting uh, specimens of Bombus vosnesenskii or the yellow-faced bumblebee um, or the very unhelpful common name of vosnesenskii's bumblebee. Uh, and this is a, a, probably your most common bumblebee species in California now. Um, and basically, I began collecting genetic material by cutting off a small amount of the mid leg uh, in order to look at things like foraging range and dispersal distance. And I began doing that in 2015 as basically a pilot season for my first uh, uh, field season. And 
this is the distribution of my sites. It's worth noting that each of these dots represents sort of a cluster of sites. Um, you know, and, and that was all hunky dory and great. And then two fires burned right through the middle of my study area. Uh, the Rocky fire in late July of 2015, and then the Jerusalem fire in early August of 2015. Um, and uh, for better or worse, these fires cut my sites basically right in half. So in two subsequent years, 2016 and 2017, uh, I went back out and collected more genetic material uh, from these uh, sites. So what we have is this cool scenario where we have both burned and unburned sites from before and after fire, uh, allowing us to address possibly some questions uh, that using space for time substitutions don't allow for. And what we found uh, first was, you know, congruent with the, the literature and, and our expectations from knowing the study area, we found that initially there were uh, more flowers in the burn sites compared to the unburned sites. Uh, but interestingly, we found that actually really early in the spring, there wasn't a difference between uh, flower abundance in the burned and unburned sites, where the difference in flower abundance uh, in the burn sites arises is that those burn sites basically bloomed for longer. Uh, so the removal of thatch or invasive grasses uh, basically allowed forbs to bloom for uh, a few more weeks than they did in the unburned sites. Uh, perhaps disappointingly for any botanists listening is that I'm not going to go super deep into uh, uh, the sort of plant side of this story, uh, because at least as far as bumblebees were concerned and the foods that they were consuming, uh, there weren't any large changes in plant identity that were observed in this study. So uh, they foraged on a lot of fabaceous things before fire and they foraged on those same plants after fire. There was just sort of more of them uh, in the burned areas compared to the unburned areas. Uh, it is worth noting uh, an interesting component of this is that Vicia velosa uh, vetch was, uh, I think about, I would have to check the numbers, but about 50% of my bumblebee captures uh, were often from vetch. So a um, little mixed management conundrum there, I suppose. Um, yeah, and there are, of course, other fire following species in this landscape, but these were the, the dominant food sources for bumblebees. For the visual learners out there, you know, basically what we had was before fire, we have these plants, these forbs poking up uh, through, you know, last year's growth and competing with invasive grasses. And then after fire, we had these nice dense mats of bumblebee food, if you will. Uh, and an important, uh, you know, prereq for the, the rest of the discussion is that in that first year following fire, we did observe more bumblebees on the, uh, in the sites where there were more flowers. So there wasn't some, uh, presumably there wasn't some mass mortality event from fire, which resulted in there being no bumblebees present in the landscape. Uh, so in, in that initial sort of examination of the post-fire landscape, we found that there's more flowers following fire, they bloomed for a longer duration, and bumblebee workers were nice and abundant on those flowers. Uh, and that's, you know, potentially not too surprising, that largely confirms what we would expect from the literature. But the interesting thing we can do with this data is really consider how we measure bumblebee population size. Uh, so we saw a lot of workers, which is definitely nice, but that's not the reproductive unit of a bumblebee population. Uh, instead, what we might want to find out is whether or not we're just looking at a few lucky colonies out on the landscape. So you could imagine a scenario where we observe a lot of workers, uh, but they come from just a couple colonies or, you know, maybe more realistically, a, a few dozen colonies or something like that. But a small population size like that might be susceptible to predation pressure or disease uh, or any number of, you know, small population effects uh, compared to some other scenario where we have that same number of workers, but they are coming from a bunch of different colonies, uh, which might be a more robust population. But, you know, we have this, this fundamental limitation uh, as entomologists where we often want to just go out with our bug nets, count a bunch of things, and then tell you about it. Uh, but with this sort of data, all I can really tell you is that I caught 
five bumblebees, but I can't tell you if those five individuals are from five different colonies or if they're all from the same colony. Instead, thankfully, we have that genetic data from before and after fire, uh, so we can use genetic mark recapture to estimate colony abundance. And the basic idea here is that we catch a bunch of individuals, uh, we know their spatial locations, and we collect genetic material from them. We can then extract uh, DNA and genotype them, and then uh, using a bunch of math and computers, we can assign them to their most probable colony. So uh, we can determine, for example, that from our seven individuals that we captured here, uh, the three individuals in red are siblings, so they're from the same colony. Uh, the two individuals in blue are from the same colony, and yellow and green are singletons. Uh, and this is similar to genetic mark recapture uh, normally, normal genetic mark recapture, but instead of having redetections of individuals, we have redetections of colonies. And we don't know the colony location for these individuals, but we can take sort of our best guess that it's the halfway point uh, between the individuals that we, we gathered. And that allows us to crudely estimate foraging range and dispersal distance. Uh, but importantly, we know that we captured seven individuals, but they belong to four different colonies. And we can use that distribution of recaptures to estimate the uh, uh, expected number of colonies in the landscape total. So we can use that sort of method to ask which scenario occurs. Uh, does the post-fire landscape actually support more colonies or is it just aggregating the existing population? And that has different uh, consequences for how we might interpret the effects of fire. So when we look at the maximum likelihood number of colonies before fire, what we find is that uh, our, our burn sites initially had a few more colonies than our unburned sites, uh, but not really much of a difference. And then after fire, uh, not only do we see more workers in the burn sites, but those workers are actually from substantially more colonies. Um, and it's also worth noting here that you'll see that the error bar is massive. And that's because we actually detected so many unique colonies that we very infrequently detected recaptures of a colony. So you get this huge uh, error in your estimate, but it's a far larger number of colonies in the burn sites than the unburned sites. What we don't know here is whether this is due to the same number of colonies that starts every year surviving better due to the increased uh, floral abundance, or if, call it, if queens are from the surrounding landscape dispersing into the burned area because there's so many flowers. Um, and those are interesting things to uh, pursue in future research. Uh, in general, we saw a higher colony abundance at sites with higher flower abundance. Uh, and I, I think this is also an encouraging result because it, it sort of goes along with a few other studies of bumblebees recently where uh, folks saw a lot of workers because there were a lot of flowers and those workers end up being from a lot of colonies. So the hope here is that eventually we get to the point where we can just uh, feel confident that when you see a lot of workers, it's due to there being a lot of colonies and then we don't have to spend this money to uh, do the genetic work in order to truly estimate colony abundance. It makes monitoring programs a little bit more affordable. Uh, additionally, we looked at body size between burned and unburned sites. Uh, and basically what you do there is you measure the distance between wing bases and that is correlated with uh, overall body mass and typically uh, body fat content. Uh, and larger body bees and colonies that produce larger body bumblebees uh, typically have higher reproductive rates and higher survivorship. Uh, so this allows us to, you know, consider a scenario where we have more colonies, but each colony is kind of producing crappy small workers uh, versus, you know, a scenario where there's more colonies, but they're also producing larger workers. Uh, and what we find, once again, is before fire, not much of a difference between burned and unburned sites. After fire, there's about a 4% increase in the mean size of workers uh, in burned sites. And that might not sound like a huge increase, but when you feed this same species of bumblebee unlimited amounts of food in the lab, you see only about a 6% increase in body size. So the fact that we're just netting individuals off of flowers in the landscape and they're 4% larger is, is actually a 
pretty surprising to observe. Um, and that small increase in body size with this species uh, is also associated with higher queen production and things like that. Uh, but as uh, folks in that region might be familiar, uh, the effects of fire petered out pretty fast. So um, uh, by 2017, so two growing seasons after fire, a lot of those invasive grasses are back. The thatch from the previous year is causing forbs to grow a little bit crappier. Uh, and uh, I, I believe it was what year isn't a drought year anymore, but um, it was pretty dry that spring. And um, so overall, basically body size uh, differences between burned and unburned sites were pretty muted. Uh, and back to even below pre-fire levels. Uh, but once again, uh, this response is basically well predicted by floral abundance. So sites with higher uh, floral abundance tended to have bigger bodied bees. Uh, and then lastly, I looked at reproduction. So uh, as you might recall, uh, bumblebee queens emerge in the spring uh, but the number of queens that we observe in the spring is most likely predicted by the conditions when they were produced the previous year. Uh, so there's a time lag. So when we look at queen abundance, what we find is that before fire, or actually in this case, we do not have before fire data. In the first year following fire, uh, there's not much of a difference between burned and unburned sites in their number of queens. So uh, that either suggests that queens survive the fire or uh, dispersed into the, the area after fire. Uh, but then after fire, what we saw is an increase, or one year after the effects of fire, uh, what we saw is an increase in the number of queens in both burned and unburned sites. Um, and I think what's interesting is that when we dive into our genetic mark recapture data a little bit, what we find is that there's actually sibling queens who presumably were produced uh, by colonies within the burned area and then dispersed into the unburned area. So uh, using that mark recapture data, we have some evidence that basically uh, colonies have a really good year uh, within the burned area and then those effects result in spillover into the surrounding landscape. So uh, potentially, you know, these fires are serving as a release from limitation. So from this study, there's more colonies following fire. Those colonies are not resource limited and reproduction is increased and spills over into the unburned area. Yay. Um, I'm gonna now briefly just tell you about one other study that I was a collaborator on because I just think it's so cool. Um, I can't explain it as well as Eric, uh, but I'll, I'll do my best. These are some slides that he shared with me. This is Eric Lopresti. Uh, if you ever get a chance to go to where he is now, Oklahoma State University, and chat with him. Uh, he is a profound naturalist. Uh, so we looked at this mint uh, Trichosma laxum, um, which has a dominant purple morph, but also a recessive pink morph. And uh, this allows us to actually look at outcrossing rates by growing these things um, uh, in a greenhouse. Uh, and there's also massive differences in the size of these plants. Uh, so this is a reproductively mature individual on the left, despite producing only one flower, uh, and a reproductively mature individual on the right that produced over 10,000 fruits. Um, and the size of these plants is basically just due to their microsites, uh, which you can imagine changes a lot uh, in burned and unburned areas. So we use this plant and our ability to look at outcrossing to ask how fire affects reproduction. Um, in, in this plant. Uh, and I think it's worth noting that, you know, you can apply this sort of logic of fire to any number of other events that cause a super bloom, if you will. Uh, and so we asked, does this big uh, flowering pulse after fire promote or depress outcrossing? It's also important to note that these morphs don't differ in seed set or bibbery, the pollinators that visit them. So it's a fair comparison to use the the pink morph to sort of estimate outcrossing in the population. And when we consider the pollinators of Trichostoma, uh, before fire, we often have very small uh, bees mostly visiting them. And uh, a lot of them are stem nesting bees actually. And then after fire, we have predominantly large bodied uh, bees and we've lost a lot of the stem nesters. 
This slide isn't directly related to the plant outcrossing question, but it's interesting, so I threw it in. Uh, but getting back to our plant outcrossing question of interest, uh, what we found is that there's reduced outcrossing following fire, um, or another way is to say increased inbreeding. Uh, so when you look at the stem diameter of Trichostoma, which is associated with the number of flowers it produces, basically bigger plants uh, had lower levels of outcrossing, uh, and we only had bigger plants in the burned uh, sites. Basically what's happening here is the plants become so large that pollinators, instead of moving flower or plant to plant, and excuse me that this is a lupin instead of a, a trichostoma in, in case that bothers anyone to their soul. Uh, instead of having pollinators moving from plant individual to plant individual, instead you have them moving within inflorescences. Uh, so basically transporting pollen just within the same uh, individual plant. So I think this is a really cool uh, project and you know, allows us to think about how uh, fire might affect plant reproduction and not just you know, pollinator abundance. Of course, the caveat with all these sorts of studies is that the effects of fire, I, I shouldn't even say probably, uh, the effects of fire are certainly very context dependent. Uh, there's going to be big differences between growing season fires, dormant season fires. Uh, when we consider different nesting guilds of bees, there's going to be large differences. If we consider fire in a grassland and chaparral environment versus uh, something like a closed canopy forest, that's going to result in massive differences. I suppose also wildfire and prescribed fire, we can keep listing these things. Um, and you know, I would also hesitate to extrapolate the results here to at-risk species. So uh, in this study, I used Bombus vasdesenskii because that was about 95% of the bumblebees at the reserve. Uh, but if we wanted to know about, you know, the using prescribed fire to manage um, rusty patch bumblebee habitat, for example, we would really need to learn the difference between are these colonies surviving fire and then uh, taking advantage of those resources, or is it recolonization? And if it's recolonization, if there's some mass mortality event from fire, uh, a rare species might not have uh, populations available to recolonize an area. And my slides seem to have frozen. Okay, the effects of fire are very transient as well. Uh, so, you know, just shortly after fire, uh, I want to show you the next slide, but I want to finish this thought. You know, the effects of fire might be a lot more long lived in something like an open can or a closed canopy forest that then becomes open canopy. Uh, and you might have conversion to more open habitat for a much longer time. But within this system, uh, just two seasons after fire, uh, you know, invasive grasses like oat grass and rye and all sorts of things are back. Uh, and, and we just really had these small patches of mimulus um, along some of the riparian areas. Here's my, my dog for reference, so you can know that these aren't giant mimuluses. Um, and, you know, like this is the first growing season after fire in that exact same meadow. And this is it a year later at the same time of year. So uh, very transient effects. Uh, and I, I, I think, you know, if, if, uh, if you're listening to this, but you're not sold on uh, how cool fire is for fire's sake yet, uh, but you actually tuned in because you really love pollinators. I think it's it's interesting to think about uh, fire as a sort of general disturbance that can help us reveal answers to other questions of interest. Um, so one of the big questions in pollinator conservation, especially in agricultural areas, is when we do these restorations uh, where we put a bunch of flowers next to tomato crops or something like that, uh, what we want to know is if we're actually increasing the population size, the local population size of bees, or if we're just attracting all the bees from the surrounding landscape to these uh, flowering strips. And often these are really small scale plantings, so it's kind of hard to get dramatic effect sizes and really see what's happening. Uh, but something like a fire can really reveal uh, these effects of resource limitation and, and how pollinators respond to them. So I, I think it's really interesting to think about from that perspective. 
Uh, one thing I'm really jazzed about and wanted to mention before I close up uh, is, is something that I haven't had a chance to get back to yet, but I hope to, uh, is moving beyond thinking about, uh, at least for pollinators, moving beyond thinking about you know, flowers after fire and how that affects pollinators. But I often think about, um, for better or worse, when we're sitting in smoke clouds in California or Colorado, I think about how we have these long uh, periods of air pollution and uh, all sorts of changes that come with um, indirect effects of fire like smoke or heating adjacent to burned areas. Uh, and how these sort of effects can affect insect navigation or the fouling of nectar and pollen uh, or disrupt pollination services. Um, and I think, I think this is a really interesting area to pursue beyond just the sort of before and after burned and unburned effects of fire. Uh, and when I did a, a small amount of digging into it, I actually found a paper from 1980, uh, which found that basically air concentration resulted in uh, changes in mating patterns for some solitary bees. So I think this could be a, a really interesting area to take these sorts of fire studies in. Uh, and with that, I'll take any questions or, uh, you know, scathing critiques, whatever you got. Thank you so much, John. That was fascinating. I learned so much. Um, it makes me want to uh, sort of jump, jump over to your line of work. Uh, super, super cool. Um, okay, so we have uh, I, we have some questions popping up in the chat box. So I'll just uh, get us going with those. Um, so uh, we have one question that from Erin, and I believe it's Erin Conlisk, although I'm not sure on that. Um, is is there an interaction between fire and serpentine outcrops? Um, which are frequent in McLaughlin and potentially have higher floral diversity and often uh, lower floral productivity on those serpentines. Yeah, uh, I'm going to give a lame answer and say almost certainly, uh, but I, for the most part, avoided uh, uh, serpentine soils in my site selection. Um, though I think at least, sorry, it's been it's been a minute since I've been to McLaughlin. Um, but yeah, I, I guess I would say almost certainly there's going to be an interaction between those. And if you look at, you know, Susan Harrison's work, um, looking at the effects of fire and serpentine, and you see that uh, change in floral species diversity following fire, I'm just going to guess that that would be reflected in bee species diversity. So for the most part, uh, besides the loss of stem nesters, we just basically saw that wherever there was uh, more flowers following fire, there were more bees and more species of them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Thank you. Um, Aaron had dropped in another question with that one. So, um, uh, and it is, how can the number of colonies um, increased so rapidly after a fire, given that the number of queens was defined in the previous year, um, other than spillover from non-burned areas? Yeah, so I think um, one thing to keep in mind, and I hope this answers, but uh, you can clarify if not, um, it's basically thought that a ton of queens can uh, start each year, but very few of them are actually successful in establishing a colony and growing that colony to an appreciable size to be detected. Um, so like when we gather queens and we rear them in the lab, uh, we get about a 40% success rate of, well, we get, we get about 80% survivorship. So the queens survive in our little rearing boxes. Uh, but only about a 40% success rate of queens making actually any amount of workers. Uh, and then even fewer of those make really healthy and large colonies that would be likely to be detected out in the landscape. Uh, so what I think could be happening is that uh, you have the, you, ha you either have recolonization of a bunch of uh, queens that are attracted to the, these really high floral abundances, uh, and then you have the same level of success in colony establishment, or you have more or less the same number of queens starting uh, that year. And then 
uh, you have much higher levels of success as the floral abundance is much higher. That makes sense. Yeah, thank you for that answer. I guess I have a follow on may maybe, which is, um, you know, when you're talking about sort of dispersal of these queens and you, you mentioned that you saw them um, sibling queens that were um, located eight kilometers apart. And I guess mm -hmm. I just have like a general question of like, how far are they known to disperse? Um, yeah, across these landscapes. Yeah, so uh, bumblebee dispersal is a big unknown. So uh, in, in this study, I forget exactly how many queens, sibling queens we actually observed. Um, and there's a few different ways to observe sibling queens. One is that you detect a colony in, um, we'll just use right now as an example. We detect a colony in 2020, and then we catch a queen in 2021. And she is a sister of workers that we captured the previous year or we catch two queens this year that are siblings of each other and they're separated by some distance. So there's a few different ways to detect queens. Um, I forget exactly how many we, we got, but it wasn't a very impressive number. And I wanna say it was less than a dozen. Um, so you know, when I say that there was spillover, it's not a super robust result, um, but it's sort of the best that we can do. Um, and yeah, we observed distances of up to eight kilometers or really the maximum distance between our sites. Uh, but believe it or not, that stands as the only estimate of uh, bumblebee dispersal distance in all of North America. Uh, and then there are two other studies from Europe uh, from really the same 25 by 25 kilometer area of Southern England. Uh, that look at dispersal of bumblebee queens, um, you know, and then, then we have population genetic studies that sort of give us really indirect estimates of how far they can move. Um, so eight kilometers for a bumblebee, to answer your question more directly, really isn't that unexpected, um, but also we don't really have great data on it. Yeah, so th there are some... Um, estimates from non-native bumblebees and range expansion in South America uh, that suggests numbers upwards of 60 kilometers a year are actually not unfathomable, but it's debatable if, if you know, they're getting uh, blown away by wind currents or something like that. Interesting. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, Okay, so we have an, uh, Aaron has another one. She says, super cool work. Um, and her question is, why is it that so few queens make colonies? Is it pre-wintering provisioning? Um, so then that would be why you have the numbers of queens increasing two years after a fire. Uh, why is it that so few queens make colonies? Mm -hmm. That's the um, uh, can you actually just repeat it? I want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So why is it that so few queens make colonies? Is it uh, pre-wintering provisioning? So then that would be why you have the number of queens increasing two years after a fire. Um, so each queen only can live for a maximum of one year uh, and is produced by a colony the previous year. So I, I'm not quite sure I understand the second part, but um, Generally, the reasons for queens being unsuccessful at uh, establishing colonies after they emerge is unknown, um, but there's a variety of potential reasons. Uh, one is that uh, the queen actually never mated. Um, so the only thing they could do is produce a bunch of males because um, bumblebees have this weird uh, mating system where they're haplodiploid. Uh, so unmated queens and workers, as well as mated queens, uh, can make diploid individuals, which are males, or haploid individuals, which are males, uh, and only mated queens can make diploid individuals or uh, females. Um, so it's, it's possible that those queens are not mated, um, so they fail to uh, establish a, a workforce, basically, and then, you know, don't have a, a good time getting provisions. Um, it's possible that they have nematode parasites, uh, which will cause them, instead of establishing a colony, they'll basically uh, dig themselves a grave uh, and 
participate in that nematode's life cycle. Um, and, you know, then it's just like, yeah, they could have uh, poor nutrition. So they, they used up their whole fat body overwintering. Um, it's, it's sort of just like, I could keep rattling off different reasons, but uh, don't have a good, like, this is the most common reason, or this is the best reason for this system, um, which is both uh, uh, really galling thing and also exciting because I guess there's still a ton to be learned. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you for that. All right. So are there other questions? Now's the time if folks want to add, add any, be brave and add their questions to the chat box. And while folks are sort of uh, uh, typing away, hopefully I have, I'll have, I'll sort of ask you one. Um, sure. So, uh, So do you think like, um, so if, if bumblebees sort of, you know, respond to this, this pulse of, of Forbes post fire, do you think that they're like the reduction in fire on the landscape, it would make sense has affected bumblebee populations sort of historically or over time? And then do you think of sort of, um, or what are your thoughts on whether prescribed burns can be thought of or used as a way to facilitate and restore some of these declining populations? Um, so yeah, I think it's probably pretty likely that a lot of uh, bumblebee species are uh, more well adapted to frequent fire and some are uh, more adapted to less frequent fire. Um, uh, yeah, I think, you know, especially in California, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and in general, I think once again, these sort of things that lead to uh, increased floral abundance or, or maintenance of these um, uh, open habitats that bloom for extended periods of time uh, is going to generally be positive for bumblebees. Um, the Xerces Society sort of in their vet hedging makes a recommendation for prescribed burning that you leave, I think a third or maybe some, somewhere between a third and a half of the given property unburned uh, just in case it does result in high mortality. Uh, though I have to say I'm a little skeptical of the uh, possibility of high mortality. I, I think that it's probably likely that a lot of species survive fire uh, at the right time of year. So um, uh, to simplify things, I said that bumblebees, you know, produce queens and then overwinter uh, early in the fall. Um, but in California, or at least in this study region, uh, that hibernation probably actually begins closer to midsummer, uh, just because the whole life cycle is sort of shifted. Um, and so in this case, the fires burned in late July and early August, which is pretty likely when these queens were already uh, overwintering. Um, and we don't know a ton about the depth that they overwinter at, but we have some evidence that it's, uh, you know, like, uh, I want to say maybe a dozen centimeters or so. Um, and that's going to be enough in certain soil types. Uh, I hesitate to say while talking to a soil biologist, but uh, uh, I, my understanding at least is that that is enough to buffer sort of the extreme heat effects of fire. Um, but, uh, you know, that's also going to depend on the habitat type as well. Like a grass, if they're overwintering in the grassland areas, uh, that fire is going to burn really quickly uh, and maybe the effects of heat exposure will be more muted um, versus if they're overwintering in forested habitat, uh, that heat might penetrate deeper into the, the soil. Great, thank you for that answer. Um, we're approaching the top of the hour, but um, uh, maybe if we can get to one more question. Um, uh, so Craig Beckman uh, asks, uh, if other bumblebee species are likely to show a similar response to fire and might fire be bad for some species and good for others? Yeah, I think so. and. Um, you know, I guess to, to piggyback that off of the previous question, 
if we knew more about where bumblebees overwinter and we knew some species overwinter very shallow uh, in their substrate and some overwinter very deeply uh, or some, you know, uh, it's been said that some overwinter in uh, rotten logs, uh, you know, then, then we might know the susceptibility of those species to basically being burned by fire. Uh, and then those species that overwinter in places that are likely to uh, suffer mortality from fire would be less beneficial, um, uh, would benefit less from fire uh, than others. Um, and there's also likely changes in pollen nutrition due to fire. And so that, that might have diet effects that vary by species. Um, yeah, I would actually say that uh, you know, a, a huge chunk of bumblebee biology comes from studying common species like I did, uh, or even species, even worse, species that you can purchase commercially. Um, and so we, we have these like three to six really common species that we use as surrogates for all the other bumblebees, but we know that those are common and stable species, but we use them to, to inform our management of uh, less common or declining species. But if they were the same, then there wouldn't be common and declining species, right? So uh, it's, it's definitely a big problem in our ability to make inferences across species. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Awesome. Okay. Well, I, I think that's all the time we have for questions. And I just want to say, John, thank you so much again for joining us um, uh, and taking the time to share your expertise and experience with the group. I mean, I, I learned a ton and there's a lot of appreciation coming in the chat box right now that um, I don't think you're able to see, but um, it, you know, I, I think folks are um, really excited about what they learned today and appreciate you taking the time. So thank you. Cool. And yeah, thanks for yeah. Oh, I was just going to say thank you so much. It was nice uh, to think about fire again. It's definitely been a minute and I, I wish I could just like talk to you more, you all more freely about fire in person, but maybe, uh, maybe someday. Ne next time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you everybody for, uh, for joining again this week. We'll look forward to seeing you Next week, next week we have Dr. Emily Fairfax um, from Cal State Channel Island, who's going to talk to us about beaver dams and fire mitigation. Um, so uh, we will look forward to seeing everybody next week. And thanks again. Take care. Adios, y'all. Bye.